So um, Connor is a PhD student uh, at the University of East Anglia uh, in the lab of uh, Ben Miller, where he is conducting his PhD sponsored by the BBSRC scholarship. And so if Connor, you want to take over and show everyone sort of response and plans. Cool. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak. Um, I'm Connor Tansley, and the focus of my work is on decoding calcium signals in response to salt in plants. So the reason that this is important is because with increasing climate change, we're seeing a rise in incidence in high salinity soils. We're also seeing increased flooding and drought responses, um, and a lot of plants are capable of resisting these stresses, but a lot of our crop plants aren't, so it's quite a threat to global food security. One of the signaling components that underlines these stresses and links all of them together is calcium signaling, which is involved in a wide variety of processes, but especially involved in salt nutrient deficiency and drought responses. So calcium signals, as I'm sure many of you know, um, vary in type uh, in response to the stress that they're triggered by. So you can have these monophasic signals, which are signals with a single peak, you can have biphasic signals with two-step peaks. You can have oscillations which go up, return to baseline, and followed by another peak. And these signals vary in terms of duration, amplitude, and frequency. And you have these different signals in response to different stresses. Um, and these different signals also take place in different parts in the cell. So the subcellular localization of the decoding uh, components is actually particularly important because intracellular stores will release calcium, but also at the plasma membrane, you can have release of calcium from extracellular spaces to make these signals. So the particular decoders that we're interested in is the CBL CYPK pathway. So CBLs are calcineurin B-like proteins and CYPKs are CBL interacting protein kinases. And the way that they work is that when the calcium comes through uh, the membrane, um, after a stimulus as part of the salt signal, the CBL will bind the calcium with its EF hands, its calcium binding domain, and the CBL will be localized to a particular membrane. When it binds the calcium, it goes through a conformational change, and that conformational change is transduced through its interacting protein kinase to allow that kinase to become active and phosphorylate downstream proteins. So in other eukaryotes, they have a homologous sensor. So similar to the CBL, they have this calcineurin B, and they're quite similar in terms of structure. They both have 4EF hands. They both um, sense the calcium, and that's somewhat similar to calmodulin, although there's a different structure for calmodulin. But calcineurin B in other eukaryotes uh, functions quite differently. It interacts with this calcineurin A, and calcineurin A will also interact with calmodulin, and they will dephosphorylate downstream signals. So important thing to remember is that CBLs and CYPKs will phosphorylate downstream signals. So one of the things hampering this current research is that most of the studies um, have shown that there's a lot of dysfunctional redundancy. So traditionally in plants, we'll do a genetic knockout, we'll test for phenotype, and we'll try and define the function of that gene or that protein um, based on that genetic knockout. But in the CBL CYPK pathway, if you knock out one of those CBLs, you can get compensation through another CBL to reconstitute that same tolerance. So you actually have no detectable phenotype. Similarly to that, the CYPKs um, can also be functionally redundant. So you might have a CBL, you might knock out a CYPK, and it will actually just um, interact with another CYPK to carry out the same response. So that's hampered like ascribing function to a lot of these CBLs and CYPKs. But based on the ones that we have managed to get um, through double knockouts or triple knockouts, or sometimes single knockouts have been effective, um, we've managed to ascribe this pathway mostly to drought, nutrient deficiency, and salt responses. Um, this functional redundancy is mainly a problem because a lot of the studies in plant biology focus on crop plants such as rice and maize or on model plants such as Arabidopsis. And the CBL-CYPK pathway in um, Arabidopsis and these crop plants 
has more than 10 CBLs and more than 20 SIPKs, which makes a very large number and a very complex system of potential interactions for different downstream responses. So we wanted to take a slightly different approach to this, and we've decided to look at a liver work called Marcantia. And in Marcantia, there's only three CBLs and two SIPKs. And Marcantia is kind of a cousin of a moss, so it's, it's more closely related to moss than it is to a lot of the crop plants. But we think it's a very good model for deconvoluting um, this signaling pathway in response to calcium signals. So the reason we think it's a good model for this is because um, it's relatively fast growing in terms of plants. So it will grow to its adult life phase in about a month. We have a fully sequenced genome as of 2018. Um, we're capable of carrying out agrobacterium mediated transformation. So that means we can insert transgenes and those transgenes can include CRISPR Cas9 gene editing tools. Um, and because the plant is actually haploid, so it only has one copy of its genome in its dominant life phase, it's very easy to do a single knockout of a gene, um, which is a huge benefit um, compared to some of the decapoidy that you see in um, a lot of crop plants. So another benefit of this system is the fact that it's capable of asexual reproduction through these cup structures here. So from a single cell, you get a gem A cup arise, and inside that you'll have small plant propagules that are clonal from the cell that they've arised from. So if you have a knockout, you can keep that knockout going. And also it's capable of sexual reproduction. So these structures here are the female sexual reproductive organs. And underneath there, you can see the white, and that white is actually showing that this sexual structure is fertilized. So we can cross our knockouts to get higher order mutants relatively quickly. The reason we think that a lot of this work will actually be translatable and that we can build up a fundamental model of how the CBL and SIPK interaction works and how that pathway decodes a calcium signal is because that um, Marcantia has already been shown to be conserved in a lot of the fundamental signaling pathways, including hormonal signals. So the first step in carrying out this research was to look at, does Marcantia actually produce calcium signals. So we inserted an ArcEcho cassette, which is a fluorescent reporter for calcium. And we treated with 100 millimolar salt and managed to detect a nice biphasic signal in response to the salt. Um, and this signal seemed predominantly localized at the plasma membrane, although that would take further tests to fully prove. Um, we have also used an inhibitor here. So that's an inhibitor for a calcium, calcium ion channel just to show that this is actually a calcium response because we blocked the channel uh, and the signal is abolished. So the next step from this was to look at our sensors and our kinases and see if any of them are affected um, in expression in response to salt. So somewhat counterintuitively, we're actually looking for down regulation here. And the reason for that is because um, the genes themselves are typically, or at least known in higher plants, the ones that respond to salt, are typically massively upregulated in a certain subset of cell types in the root, but downregulated globally in response to the salt signal. So we were looking for downregulation. We have a positive marker for the salt signal here, LEA1. Um, and then if we look at the kinases, we can see that both of them seem to be downregulated in a dosage-dependent manner. So this means from this data, we can't actually say which kinase would likely be linked to salt signaling. But we do have a very good sensor or CBL um, that is downregulated in a dosage dependent manner and the other ones aren't. So we think we have a candidate uh, sensor for the calcium signal in response to salt. The next step from this was to look at which of the SIPKs does the CBL interact with or does it in fact interact with both? to try and get a better idea of which might be the interacting partner uh, for carrying out the salt signaling. So we have RCBLC as conferring salt tolerance, and we carried out a yeast-2 hybrid. And in the yeast-2 hybrid, you split a transcription factor and fuse half to a SIPK, half to a CBL. And essentially, if they interact, they'll reconstitute the transcription factor, which allows them to survive on this plate here. And this plate here is just the control for the yeast growth. So we've included CBL A, B, and C, and CIPK A and B from Marcantia. We've also included these mutants, which are 
um, have the CPL interacting domain remo removed. So these are a negative control for the interaction. And we've included some salt sen a salt sensitive SIPK, SIPK24 from Arabidopsis, and a salt sensitive CBL, CBL4 from Arabidopsis. So this was trying to look whether this is a conserved system from Arabidopsis to Marcantia, whether it's a unique system in Marcantia for salt response. Um, and from this, we found that uh, SIPK24 interacts with CBL B and C. So it could be that CBL B is functionally redundant to CBL C. Um, and we also found that CBL4 specifically interacts with SIPK A. And CBLC, which was our likely salt sensor based on the transcription data, is also specific for SIPKA. So while we don't know what CBLB is involved in, we do think CBLC and SIPKA are the salt tolerance pathway um, that is downstream of this salt signal. We tried to, because yeast is quite a heterologous system, we want to confirm this using a tobacco-based system as well, which is a bit more similar because it's a plant. And for this, we're using biomolecular fluorescent complementation. So this is still ongoing work, but essentially in that system, you split a venous protein, use half to a CBL, half to a CYPK, and if they interact, then you'll see this fluorescence here. So we've only managed to do CBL4 and CYPKA so far, but we can see a nice fluorescence that seems to be localized to the plasma membrane. Um, and we want to go on to test all of the positive and negative interactions from the yeast just to confirm which ones are actually taking place in a slightly more similar system. So the next step from this is to actually look at knockouts because we want to knock out the gene um, to see if that actually confers salt susceptibility because that will confirm for us that that SIPK is involved in salt tolerance. So, so far we've only had luck with, we have had some luck with the CRISPR-Cas9 system and we managed to knock out CYPKB and we now have four lines for CYPKA and two lines for CYPKB, but we haven't managed to do all the genotyping for them yet. Um, but this will form part of a larger piece of work once we've gone on from the salt work and we want to take this and deconvolute the whole system in Marcantia so we can actually conclusively say CBLC and CYPKA are involved in salt tolerance and a knockout of one confers susceptibility. And then we want to go on to figure out what is CYPKB involved in, do a full panel of phenotyping for both CYPKs, and then carry out knockouts on CBLs A, B, and C, look at overlap with the phenotypes from those, pair that with the interaction data, and then hopefully we can ascribe function in this subset of calcium signaling responses to all of the components of this pathway. And as part of that work, we already formed a collaboration through Open Plant with a group in Cambridge, the Hasselhoff Lab, and they've managed to localize um, CBLA to the tonoplast of the cell, which is the big watery pouch called the vacuole in a plant cell, and the tonoplast is the membrane of the vacuole. And we want to go on to also carry out um, the same sort of tests on CBLs B and C, to localize those in Marcantia. And then we want to start looking at pure mechanistic understanding of how this pathway works, because that will allow us to actually implement this in biotechnological tools for the future. So thank you for listening to the talk. Um, I'd like to acknowledge my supervisors, the collaborators that carried out the fluorescent response work in Cambridge um, under the Open Plant Grant, my colleagues in the lab, um, some of my students who have carried out some of the work as well, um, and the funders that have helped fund me through this and the university that supported me through this. So if there are any questions, I'll just stop the slideshow and then I can answer those. Okay, thank you, Connor, for a very nice talk. If you, have, if you guys have any questions, you can type them in the chat, but... Um, Okay, we have one question uh, in the chat from Sandeep. Uh, I don't know if you want to ask it yourself or I can read it for you, uh, okay, Sandeep. so how does calcium influx No, I can ask it. Oh. Yes, please. Yeah, you can read it, it's fine. <laughs> yeah. what's, the, what's the link between calcium influx and the transcriptional regulation was my question. So that's, it's kind of currently unknown. 
um, I think. We do know that I think there are salt responsive transcription factors and they will control a lot of the responses. And I think the actual response starts taking place um, and then the down regulation or up regulation in specific tissues in the plant will take place afterwards. So I'm not sure if it's downwards um, in sort of downstream from the calcium signal, they activate transcription factors that will upregulate themselves so they can have a more robust response. Or if it's the case that there's another system alongside the calcium system that is reinforcing it. So the signal continues to take place while they're under the stress. So as they express more, they can make a more, uh, a stronger signal later, I suppose. And that and what sort, what sort of time frames are we talking about? Is this a rapid early gene response or so how it, long after this salt stress do you measure transcript? So we haven't managed to, it kind of depends a little bit on the life phase of the plant. We know that for sure. We haven't managed to fully check a full time frame of when this takes place. We went for a relatively safe time frame of a week after for the QPCR that I showed in this. Um, so we we treat them okay. so consistently okay. for a week and then we see the response because we wanted to see a nice distinct response. We would need to do something a little bit more high resolution with set time points to figure out how quickly this actually responds in the plant, but we don't know that yet. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, you have another question, Connor, from Christoph. Uh, Christoph, do you want to ask it yourself or you prefer us? to read it. Uh, sure, I want to ask by myself. So, uh, great talk. Thanks. Um, I, I was wondering, do you know actually the, the channel that mediates this calcium influx? Is this known? Maybe I missed it in the video. Um, I don't think, there are a range of channels that have been described in plants and there are set types of channels that are involved in calcium signals. The ones at the plasma membrane, they have uh, particular protein families, but I in this case, we don't have a specific encoding channel, I don't believe. Okay. Mm. Uh, I, oh, there's another question from Gert. Uh, do you want to ask it yourself, Gert? Or yeah, sorry, I, I might have missed it. Uh, um, and you mentioned something during the intro, um, but the calcineurin then is mm, calcineurin activation, calcineurin be like is not involved in this transcriptional because like in yeast with the crazy crazy transcription factors but maybe you missed it i need to go to another meeting in 10 minutes and i had to answer something so you might have told something about that sorry uh so we don't know necessarily how the signaling the calcium signaling affects the transcription we okay don't know that. yeah we do so calcineurin as in calcineurin be like proteins which are found in plants um, are obviously involved in this salt signaling. Um, but calcineurin B itself, the one that's found in other eukaryotes, isn't actually present in plants. We only have these calcineurin B-like proteins. Yeah, yeah. And they differ by the first EF hand. So they have like a couple of amino acids inserted in the first EF hand loop. And that's the main difference between calcineurin B and calcineurin B-like. Um, we also just, there's no calcineurin A present in plants that has been detected as of yet anyway. Um, and the affinity then of the calcineurin B like is is then also decreased, I mean decreased or compared to it's it's actually very difficult to say. So they think okay. the affinity for calcium is lower is what most of the biochemistry seems to have come out with so far. But it does still bind calcium, but it binds calcium in a slightly different structure. Um, it's the way that the loop works is slightly different because of this two amino acid insertion in the loop. Um, but it does still bind calcium as far as we're aware. But most of these studies have obviously been carried out in in vitro systems. So we can't be 100% sure that it happens in the plant, but we believe it is. Um, but so maybe in the proximity of the channel, you might get higher calcium concentrations. So which is why maybe this targeting to the channel might be key. Yeah, yeah. That's what we suspect. But as I say, we haven't managed to completely yeah. prove this yet. So thank you. Great uh, talk. So you have another question uh, from Pavi Tran. Do you want to uh, ask it yourself? Um, 
Pavitran, or you want me to read it, perhaps? Do you think the calcium yeah. signature uh, in response to salt stress would be modified by an MPCBL knockout mutant in plants? So I don't think so, because I think this is a personal opinion and not based on um, anything that we've carried out yet. But my personal opinion is that the encoding um, is somewhat separate from the decoding aspect. And I do not believe that the CBL would affect the way that the calcium signature is encoded. So through the release in the iron channel, but there's not, or at least we don't have any evidence of that yet. Um, so we'll have to see on that one. Okay. Uh, I have a question. So you should um, like sort of biphasic uh, signature. Mm -hmm. And was it that from a single cell or have you seen it in a wider field of view? And how does it look like? Is it something that moves like a wave or uh, yeah. it sort of comes up at, at once? So that is a question that I'm keen to look into in the future. Currently, the reporter that we're using is this Argeco line, and it's very good for high resolution. So we look at a single cell, we can see the, the signature that takes place in a single cell. And obviously, we then overlap that with a few signatures from a few cells to get our results. But we do not currently have a reporter transformed in Marcantia that can look on a more global scale over the plant. Uh, to see if there's a wave or anything like that yet. So that is something that we're actually um, working towards at the moment is um, putting one of these reporters that will allow us to look on a more uh, sort of lower resolution, I suppose, but to look at these potential waves um, that could be taking place. Okay, thank you. So, um... If there are no more questions for Connor for now, we can pass to the next talk. But uh, if you think about more questions after the next talk, there will be more time for uh, global discussion. So, uh, so our next speaker is Josh. Uh, Josh is a third year PhD student at the John Innes Center. He did his undergrad at, at Durham. And then he moved in the lab of uh, Hogenaut lab and Sanders Miller lab to conduct his PhD on calcium signaling and plant test interaction. So you want to take over, Josh? Yes. Is that all good? Looks good to me. Lovely. Thank you. Um, yeah. So. Thank you all for coming and, of course, the opportunity to speak here, um, as well as to Connor for uh, an excellent first talk. Um, so I'm going to start today by making a rather generous, uh, um, general and obvious point. Um, and we grow plants for a lot of reasons. You know, we grow them for pleasure, we grow them for, for fuel, um, for building materials. But most importantly, we, we grow plants for food. Um, and the way the, the world is changing and the population is growing, food security is becoming ever more important. Um, but we're not just growing this food for us. Well, we are, but we're not, we're not the only ones interested in consuming it. In fact, crop plants um, are under constant attack from a range of insect pests that also um, enjoy eating them. So on the left hand side um, here, we have um, some caterpillars or a caterpillar, um, which are the larvae of, of Lepidoptera, um, that are these chewing insects that obviously enjoy chomping away on our plants. Um, but we also have a range of different insect pests that enjoy um, consuming our plants. So on a much smaller scale here, we have um, frips, the Thysanoptera, which are around sort of one to two millimeters long. Um, and slightly larger here on the right hand side, um, there's an aphid, which is um, of the hemipteran order. Um, and these insects actually feed very, very differently to how um, a caterpillar would feed. So instead of having these big chewing mouth parts, they have a feeding cone that contains within it some flexible straw like structures called stylets. And they insert those straws into the plant and would then suck up um, some of the nutrients. The way they do so, differs between these two insects. So frips, first of all, 
use their stylets to um, macerate, destroy, kill the upper cell layers um, of a leaf, and then they will suck up the essentially like burst cell contents. Um, and this creates a very localized um, damage around a few cells, but they can do this a lot over a plant and, and spread the damage more broadly. Um, aphids, in contrast, use their stylets, which we can see um, on the bottom right here, and they navigate them through the cell layers of the plant to get down to the plant vascular tissue where um, the, the, the nutrients are being transported around the plant to make for a very um, nutrient rich um, meal essentially for the aphid. So despite these two insects both having stylets, they use them very differently. The frips produce um, a great deal of damage and the aphids try essentially not to damage plants. Um, and despite um, having this sort of finer scale feeding structure, these insects are both great problems for global agriculture. And the main reason for this is that these insects um, trans vector viruses between plants. So we have a tomato infected here with tomato spotted wilt virus transmitted by frips and cucumber mosaic virus transmitted by aphids. And of course, um, these tomatoes Inf infected with these viruses are not going to be sold in, in any of your local supermarkets, or um, at least I think I would hope not. Um, so these, these insects um, can transmit these viruses through fields, and if you were to have one of these virus outbreaks, then you could completely um, lose your crop yield, usually sort of up to about 90% of, of um, a farmer's crops could be devastated by a big virus outbreak. And um, one aphid species, for example, Mises perskei, can transmit over 100 different virus species, uh, yeah, well, viruses, um, to over 400 different plant species, making these insects um, a huge problem for global agriculture. So what we want to do is try to find ways to protect our plants um, against these insect pests and, and thus protect them against the viruses at the same time. Um, and how, how can we do that? Well, over um, hundreds and millions of years, plants have evolved their own defense responses. Um, and these defense responses are inducible. And what would, what would typically happen is we would have the insects feeding from the plants. We'd get the introduction of molecular elicitors, defense-inducing molecules that are either derived from the insect as a herbivore-associated molecular pattern or derived from the plant um, as a damage signal, a damage associated molecular pattern or a damp. Um, and these mo molecular elicitors would bind to plasma membrane receptors, um, be them channels or just receptor protein complexes. And that would trigger a signaling cascade, often including calcium signaling, which would end up um, in some kind of transcriptional reprogramming as an induced immune response, which would then go on to produce um, usually some kind of bad tasting or, or nasty chemical that would try to kill off the insects. So what we wanted to do was try to understand how plants are recognizing and naturally trying to defend themselves against these insect pests. And in the cases where it's not enough to get rid of the pest, can we supercharge, enhance that defense response to try and make plants that are more resistant to these insects. Um, there's one big problem with this, is that we really don't know the details of these molecular elicitors or these receptors that are involved in this defense response. So we wanted to try, first of all, get a, an understanding of how the responses work. And to do so, we started off by looking at how um, caterpillars are perceived by plants. It's a bit better of an ex explored system. Um, and there's actually some pathways that have, have begun to be put together for um, caterpillar perception and defense responses. And it's largely based around a damage sensing mechanism. So for example, when a caterpillar feeds, one of the recognition events that's thought to take place is that there's going to be a release of amino acids into the extracellular environment from, from the cells. Um, and that would involve an increase in apoplastic glutamate. That um, glutamate would then bind to glutamate receptor-like channels, um, homologs of the uh, mammalian iGluR receptors. Um, and that would, those, those per, uh, calcium permeable channels would open up, allowing calcium influx into the cytosol as part of a um, signaling cascade, which would end up um, 
in defense gene expression and um, signaling via jasmonic acid, a, a plant defense hormone. So what we wanted to ask is, does this signaling pathway operate in response to aphid and FRIPS attack? And to do this, we got hold of a range of receptor pro um, genetically encoded fluorescent reporters, um, the eye glue sniffer reporter, um, which allows us to detect this apoplastic glutamate, um, mutants that lack GLR receptor channels, specifically GLR 3.3 here, um, GCAMP3, which allows us to monitor um, cytosolic calcium concentrations and cytosolic calcium signals, and finally, um, a fluorescent YFP um, reporter, which is driven by promoters activated by jasmine signaling. So we could kind of monitor this final step. And before we got on to asking whether this signaling pathway is activated by aphids and FRIPS, we first of all thought um, we should look at fine scale damage. And that would be more applicable to the level of damage that could be induced by an aphid or a FRIPS when they're feeding. So we asked, does damage signaling via GLRs contribute to local or fine scale damage sensing? And for this, we um, used pooled uh, micro pipette glass needles. Um, and I had a lot of help with, from your own um, Annalisa with this. And we wounded plants that express these different reporters. So you see our very fine needle here. And to start off with, we have the glutamate reporter. So what you'll see is when we wound this little leaf here, you get an increase in fluorescence around the wound site, which is indicative then of that elevation in apoplastic glutamate, that first step in the signaling pathway that I was talking about. And if we have this elevation in apoplastic glutamate, we would expect there to be um, a downstream calcium signal that might be dependent on those GLR receptors. So we then did the same thing, but we looked downstream at a calcium reporter plant. So here we have our, our calcium reporter expressing GCAMP3. And again, we have our micro pipette needle and we wound the plant. And what I want you to um, take away from this first video of wounding a wild type plant is that when you wound it, you get a very clear elevation in calcium from the wound site that then spreads as a concentric ring away from away from the wound site. So you'll see you get the wound and then you get this ring-like structure spread radially away from the wound site. Um, so we, we have the calcium signal and we have that potentially upstream glutamate reporter signal. The next question is to ask, is uh, this calcium signal dependent then on glutamate report, uh, glutamate like receptor channels? Um, we ended up um, with this GLR 3.3 mutant that shows a really interesting calcium signaling phenotype. So instead of that ring-like structure that we previously got, when we wound the plant, we get a short, sharp burst with, of a calcium increase that then disappears and is replaced by um, a fuzzier, less intense calcium signal. So you'll see we get the short, sharp burst, disappears, and then we get that less intense calcium signal that takes its place. And we can quantify these calcium signals. So you see the wild type one, you get the short, sharp increase in fluorescence. And when we remove the GLR3 receptor, 3.3 uh, receptor in um, this orange trace, you get that short, sharp burst, which disappears and a less intense signal take its place. So um, at the moment, this, this fine scale wounding seems to induce an increase in glutamate concentrations in the apoplast, the extracellular environment, and then a calcium signal, which is partially dependent on GLR3.3 and likely downstream of that glutamate elevation. We then go um, to that last step of the signaling pathway that I, I talked about previously, and that's looking at the potential um, jasmineate signaling, which could be downstream. And on the left-hand side of each of these um, images, I have a zero-hour time point and a six-hour time point later on when we've wounded these jasmineate um, defense reporters. And you see over a sort of, it actually occurs within about sort of two to three hours, but it was still there around six to eight hours that you get an increase in signal um, over time indicative of a uh, local wound induced um, jasmineate signaling response. So at this um, point in time, we can see that fine scale wounding induces that signaling pathway that I talked about. Um, we don't yet know if this is dependent on GLR 3.3, but we're doing some work um, to try to elucidate that at the moment. 
So then we can go back to um, the original question and ask, does this damage signaling pathway via GLRs contribute to aphids and FRIPS induced defenses? So I'm going to now walk you through those same signaling pathways um, or those same signaling events that I just talked about and see if they're implicated in this response. So we go back to the glutamate reporter and we ask on, uh, first of all, does FRIPS feeding, does FRIPS damage cause an elevation in apoplastic glutamate? So you'll see the little shadow of our FRIPS here and it will start running around and every time um, there's a signal event, that's when it's essentially damaged the leaf surface. So you'll see it starts running around and we get lots of little increases in the glutamate reporter every time the FRIPS is um, essentially damaging the leaf surface. And that is very, very similar to that wound response we just looked at. I have to pause this video before I move on because people get distracted. Um, but we can do the same thing now with the aphid. So we have our aphid on the right hand side. And what we see is it walks around and you'll see that it feeds very, very differently. Instead of lots of scratches, it settles and that's it's navigating its stylets to, um, towards the phloem. So you'll see it walks around and it starts to feed around here and we get an increase in the fluorescence around the feeding site. So what this suggests is that both of these insects, when they feed, cause a transient increase in glutamate um, concentrations in the extracellular environment as they feed. And we can, we can quantify that as we did before um, with the thrips trace up here and the um, aphid trace sort of slightly lower, um, suggesting that, yeah, they both induce these elevations in apoplastic glutamate. We can then go on and we can do, as we did before, ask if there's calcium signals and are those calcium signals GLR 3.3 dependent? So we see for um, our thrips, when we look at the fluorescent change over the, the um, signal area with the wild type, we get a very clear um, spike in calcium as a sort of transient calcium increase induced by the, the FRIPS feeding events. Um, but when we remove that GLR receptor, GLR 3.3, just like we did with wounding, we get this short, sharp increase, and then we get this less intense, more drawn out signal that takes its place. Um, similarly, um, in aphids, we get a wild type um, single spike um, in our calcium signal, but when we remove the GLR 3.3 receptor, we see um, uh, an increase which then drops off and you have a more drawn out, less intense signal. Um, we do see some differences between the aphid and, and FRIPS response with the aphid induced signals being of kind of a lower intensity across the, the signal area. Um, and also seemingly a, a lower dependence on GLR 3.3, and that is probably indicative of aphids doing less damage when they feed. Um, but still, in any case, both these insects are very clearly inducing a glutamate um, elevation in the apoplast, and also a calcium signal that is um, partially dependent on GLR 3.3. So then again, we go downstream and we ask whether um, these insects are inducing that jasminate response that we saw for wounding. So we have FRIPS here at zero hours um, and eight hours and those um, transcriptional reporters that we looked at before. And I've just stuck some red arrows and this big red box here on places where the FRIPS have fed. And what we see is that whenever there's a FRIPS feeding event, we're getting an elevation in fluorescence um, around where it was feeding, around where that damage was being caused. And that's um, indicative of the FRIPS activating this jasminate response within the plants. Um, unfortunately, we really don't know what hormone signaling pathways in plants are being activated um, by aphids. And um, this is something that we're, we're currently now looking into. And I've actually tasked a summer student who starts on Monday with trying to, trying to figure some of this out. Um, so that should be fun and hopefully we'll have some stuff to share soon. Um, but for the time being, I can um, show one other very interesting result. And this is with an aphid that actually can't colonize um, Arabidopsis, the plant that we're working on. And what we see is um, when we look at survival on this y-axis over time, um, which is in days, the aphids um, on plants that have um, the wild type, essentially they do less well on plants that have um, that lack the GLR receptor. So you see the wild type plants have this decrease in survival and um, the aphids on them. But when we remove the GLR receptor, um, aphids typically survive a little bit better on these mutant plants. So this says to us that this GLR 
um, signal, GLR dependent signaling pathway is doing something um, in terms of aphid resistance. So with that, um, I shall conclude. And I hope you can take away that understanding um, plant defenses can provide some key insights for enhancing pest resistance in crop plants. Local wounding is perceived in part via glutamate damage signaling and this GLR receptor channel, which drives the calcium signaling. Um, this mechanism does contribute to FRIPS perception and also aphid perception, but because aphids seem to do less damage um, to plants, it seems that this mechanism contributes um, to a lesser extent in, in aphid-induced responses. And we know that um, GLR 3.3 dependent calcium signaling may function in insect resistance, and it might do so by activating plant JA defense signaling. Um, I'd like to thank everybody in my lab, um, my supervisory team, which includes Saskia Hogenhout, Dale Sanders, and Tony Miller, um, as well as Sam Mugford and James Canham in the lab, who um, I think without them, I'd still be trying to get, get a lab coat that fits, um, as well as um, some of the people we've worked with on, on this stuff, um, including Annalisa, it's an absolute pleasure to work with, as well as Christine and Richard, um, and of course, the bioimaging department, entomology and hort services at JIC, as well as um, my funders, Gatsby. And I shall leave you with a little picture of an aphid that I took, which I think makes them look fairly cute. So yeah, thank you all for listening and I look forward to some questions. Okay, thank you Josh for a really nice talk. Uh, you have been, there are questions queuing for you in the chat. So uh, <laughs> Kevin already asked two of them. Um, I don't know if you, Kevin, you wanted to ask them yourself to Josh or you want us to? Sure, yeah, yeah. sure. Um, so, uh, very interesting, very cool. Uh, uh, when you do the uh, artificial wounding, does the medium that you're in contain calcium? And if so, what, uh, to what extent does calcium influx through the wound contribute to the calcium signals that you're seeing? Yeah, so it's a very good question. Um, I So, what we basically do is... Um, dissect off a leaf and then we place it uh, bottom side up on water and because it has quite a hydrophobic surface it floats very well and the only thing in contact with the wound site is um, the air that surrounds it so it shouldn't influence our experiments um, too much what's in the media they're floated on on water what this does mean is that it's actually very difficult to um, apply things to the the leaf so for example if we wanted to put um, like lanthanum or a calcium channel blocker on, it's very, very difficult to do. But yeah, there shouldn't be anything but, but air in contact with the leaf. Thank you. If I could just jump in with my second question since I raised it second. Uh, um, so in addition to glutamate, I know that you can measure that, but if glutamate's coming out through the, through the wound, which is, I assume, that's the mechanism for the glutamate release, one might imagine that other biomolecules are coming out, and maybe there are receptors for those, for example, ATP, for example. And I wonder if you've thought about anything else that would be of the size or uh, you know, that might be coming out and could also uh, contribute to the phenotype. Yeah, so um, this is something that we're, we're still looking into. Um, if, if it is a, a passive release of the amino acid or amino acids from the wound site, then we would expect um, a range of other amino acids to be released. Um, and GLR 3.3 can uh, be activated by other amino acids as well. So um, they could also be acting, activating our channel as well as you say, other ligands for other receptors. Um, we haven't, there, there is a couple of other ligands that I've crossed uh, that activate different receptors and I've crossed mutants of those into the, the GCAMP reporter. Um, so we will be looking at them. Um, but for now, yeah, it kind of acts as a glutamate, as a readout amino acid. It gives us an, uh, something to look at, but is not necessarily the complete picture. So um, yeah, it's a very good point. And all we can do is sort of continue on this reverse genetics approach to try get some more more insight to how the other or well, the calcium signals working. But yeah, thank you. So we have three more questions in the chat, and then we have a raised hand uh, from Barbara. So the next question the queue was from Sandeep. 
Um, do you want to ask her? Sure. So yeah, nice talk. Um, I was just wondering, I, I may be wrong here, but there was some old literature on the role for TPCs in Arabidopsis and maybe in tobacco as well, in wounding-induced responses, including jasminate signaling. Have you looked at that? I don't know if, what the state of the TPC is in your particular species, but I wondered if that could be one of the targets. Thank yes. You. So it's actually um, what I've got going on the microscope right now. <laughs> so uh, it's a, a very good timing of the question. Um, yeah, so some of the, the early literature, as you say, did implicate TBC1 in both systemic signaling for Arabidopsis as well as um, local uh, signaling, as well as in, in an aphid context. Um, so we've done wounding experiments with TBC1. Um, mutants and we don't see a difference in the local calcium signal, the one that I just showed you. Um, and so it doesn't seem to be involved in that that local damage response. As I say, I'm, I'm doing it with the aphids at the moment to kind of double check the old finding which did implicate it. Um, if it has a role then it, so TPC1 is localized on the vacuole membrane, the tonoplast that, that Connor spoke about. Um, and that would then implicate that as an additional calcium source coming into this signal. But for the moment, um, I have no concrete answer. So yeah, hopefully it's something I can I can share in the not too distant future. Two great. weeks if everything goes well, actually. Yeah, great, thank you. Cheers. Okay, next in the line is Gert. Um, yeah, fantastic talk. I, I was just wondering whether there was a, a channel involved in the leads, uh, let's see. Um, it reminded me when I saw your calcium waves or calcium uh, about when we worked on uh, hemi channels and when you would hit uh, cells, but maybe it's indeed a passive release through the wound, maybe not via additional channels. But I was wondering whether those plant cells could also be coupled and uh, via gap junctions or alike. And, and so the neighboring cells get information from the wounded side. So uh, yeah. But double layered, but I guess the first part is is already answered. Yeah, so I can see Annalisa smiling because she knows a lot more about this than I do. Um, but I'll I'll answer anyway, and she can tell me to to shut it if I'm horribly wrong. Um, so yeah, on the on the first part, um, yeah, we assume it's a, a passive release from the damage site of ligands. Um, we talked about some experiments where you can, um, there are obviously amino acid transporters in plants um, and perhaps we could alter the, the either amino acid sort of status and um, of plants and try alter the signaling that way. But obviously if you do that, you make usually some very, very unhappy plants. Um, so yeah, it's uh, presumably a passive thing that we, we can't say for certain. On the um, gap junctions or the, the plasma desmata, um, or plasma desma, I think it's probably what I should say. Um, this is something that, that Annalisa has has worked on and looked at whether the calcium signal spreads cell to cell um, via these these junctions, via these plasma desma. Um, and I believe um, the work shows that closing those plasma desma, shutting them down, basically doesn't have an effect on the spread cell to cell of the calcium signal. So what um, we're both working with now is that the the signal probably spreads in the extracellular environment via the apoplast, um, via a, a sort of diffusion of yeah. the ligands. Obviously, well, one thing that that our both of our work would be looking at is over um, a very very short time scale. In reality, it's uh, within half an hour, and maybe things do change and communication starts to take place cell to cell via that route after that time point. Um, but yeah, that that remains to be to be seen on my part, at least. Yeah. Just for my own education, like panexins and so on, do not exist in in plant cells. It's, is, is it like that? Uh, or these panexin or inexin channels, or would they exist in plant cells? No. So we have anexins, I believe. Anexins, um, yeah, not these communicating channels. The not LHM, not um, I, I don't know by heart uh, if they. Yeah, but they're animal specific. I don't know. Yeah, there's nothing I know of. Okay, thank you. Well done. Thank you. Okay, uh, next, quest next question is from Pavitram. So, um, does this mean that glutamate calcium dependent signaling is mainly due to the wounding component of insect action? What do you expect if you if 
just an oral salivary, sec salivary secretion of the aphid trips is applied without wounding? Yes, so it's uh, a very good question. Um, I believe this component, uh, so what we, what we see is that there's a damage component in response to um, aphids and frips. And that damage response is much more dominant in response to frips than it is to aphids, which is unsurprising because frips drive their feeding by essentially damaging a plant. Um, there are clearly other mechanisms operating, whether they're damage-based or um, recognizing something in the saliva, we can't really say for yet, uh, for now. But what we are also doing in the lab is looking at um, aphid-derived elicitors and what signaling mechanisms they induce. So that would, for example, be a molecule that's found in the saliva of an aphid that could trigger a defense response. And when we look at those responses, we see them to be dependent on other machinery, for example, BAC1, um, which is a, a, a more traditional immune co-receptor within a plant, um, and also some other receptor components, which uh, my colleague James Cannon is working on um, to try a loose state. So I think when it comes to aphid feeding and FRIPS feeding, there might be something in the calcium signals that we look at that are derived from some kind of molecular elicitor from the insect. Um, and we'll start to sort of piece that together a bit more when we look at whether it's dependent on back one and whether it's dependent on some of these immune receptors. But um, yeah, for now, I'm sort of focusing more on, on the damage component, which is this, this glutamate um, GLR dependent component. But yeah, thank you for an excellent question. Uh, okay, now it's time for Barbara, which raised her hand a while ago. Yeah, Joshua, thanks a lot. That was a really interesting talk. I enjoyed that. Um, my question is a bit related to what Gert has been asking. What happens kind of downstream in a longer time scale? Is there scarring? What happens if you wait a couple of hours and put the, the, the aphid or the bug back on? Um, can the, the leaf kind of protect its... its um, good parts or, or shut down a damaged part or is there anything known? So um, the, one of the reasons I stick to this early signaling is because it gets very, very complicated later on. Um, so the reason, one of the reasons it gets very, very complicated is because both of, well, at least aphids and maybe FRIPS also introduce um, what's called effector proteins. And these are proteins which are essentially designed or have evolved to manipulate the plant in some way. So for example, aphids will introduce effectors that might suppress the defense response and try to interrupt it and stop the plant protecting itself. So over the period of sort of uh, an hour to 24 hours in that they might be feeding, um, you get all sorts of other things happening. When it comes to um, Aphids, this will either allow them to colonize the plant or it won't work well enough to let them colonize the plant. With FRIPS, it's uh, quite different because they obviously leave this big trail of dead cells behind them. Um, in some cases, they will damage the plant enough to trigger a response that spreads systemically throughout the whole plant. In other times, they can just move to another part of the plant that hasn't started defending itself yet. Um, but the difference between these insects and, for example, a caterpillar is that most of the response is local and they can just go to another part of the plant. Um, whereas a caterpillar will trigger a systemic response almost all the time, which will defend itself, the whole plant against the insect. Um, so I don't think that really answered your question, but in essence, it gets a lot more complicated and I try to avoid it. Um, but thank you. Oh, you have another question. So Kevin raised his hand. You want to speak, Kevin? Yeah, so um, I wonder, uh, since you mentioned that it's just air, you know, that the glutamate, you know, some, there's presumably some little liquid there the glutamate is being released into, and it's right where the, where the insect is sticking its nose. So does it, can they taste the glutamate? And is, is, it a, is the glutamate that's released affecting their behavior or some physiology of the, of the insect? Um, I don't, I don't know how tasteful glutamate is at that concentration. Um, so yeah, it's, it's an interesting question and it's particularly interesting for, um, aphids, which 
are sort of very highly specialized on their ability to select a host. Um, so when an aphid feeds, it inserts its stylets into the plant and then it essentially probes a few cells to get a taste for the plant and decide if it's a suitable host. Um, eventually they'll get to the phloem where there's sort of quite high pressure so they can really taste the plant then and decide that they want to stay there and it, it lets them know that feeding um, is a good idea. Whether they can taste a damaged cell is something we don't really know. Um, but they presumably can taste a cell that has a lot of defense chemicals that are harmful for them as sort of a signal that they should move on. Um, but in short, I, I don't know what their ability to perceive um, these sort of damage signals themselves are. And I imagine it's, it's not very high. But thank you. OK. So. Um... If any, if no one has more questions strictly related to the talks, then we can thank both speaker and for an excellent seminar. It was very exciting to see both works next to each other. Um, and then if someone wants to stay for the open mic session and further discussion, uh, you're welcome to stay. Uh, if the speakers want to stay longer, they can stay longer.